Hello YouTube and welcome to this video about the different ways to boost the analytical culture within your company. This presentation was originally proposed during the Timmy workshop at the Big Data Paris 2021 conference. First of all, I would like to make a little parenthesis to introduce myself. I am Frank van den Bergen, the CEO of Timmy. And in 2007, I founded the Timmy company with the mission to enable everyone to extract knowledge and value out of their data. If you haven't heard of us yet, here is where we stack up against the competition. What you see here is a G2 Quadrant for Data Science Solution. On the x-axis, you can see that Timmy is among the best solutions in terms of customer satisfaction, because we are far on the right. And the y-axis represents the number of customers, and on this axis we are about in the middle. The first product that we released in 2007 was Modeler. It's the first AutoML tool on the planet. And in 2021, Modeler remains the most advanced AI solution on the planet for banks, insurances, telecoms and supermarket companies. To summarize, we solved the predictive modeling problem in 2009. For us, this is kind of ancient history, and we really needed to move on to something much more important. Because yes, we quickly realized that the core of the problem in data analysis, the really important part, was not the predictive modeling part or the AI part, as it's called nowadays, but the data preparation part that happens just before. That's why we created Anatella in 2010. Anatella is the first data manipulation tool specifically designed for analytics, machine learning and process automation. The Timmy Suite contains two other tools. Stardust, it's a tool to do multivariate segmentation, also sometimes called clustering. And Kibela, it's a data visualization tool, a little bit like Tableau or Click. And since they are already hundreds of data viz solutions available everywhere, we saw that we make ours 100% open source and free. If you are interested, you can download Kibela on GitHub here. But hey, let's go back to the main topic of this presentation. How to start and promote an analytical culture in your company. I know that when creating new YouTube videos, the goal is to capture the audience as long as possible to please the YouTube recommendation algorithm. So the best practice is to reveal all the important conclusions only at the very end of the video to keep you watching. But it really bothers me to do that. So here is directly now the answer to the question how to obtain an analytical culture in your company. This way you already have the answer and you don't even have to watch the whole video. Now the objective of the rest of this video is to demonstrate that these five points here are not only necessary but also possible. Indeed, if you have a little experience in the analytical field, you already know that it's already very difficult to obtain the five elements here. But we will see together that it's not only possible but it's also easy with the right tools. First of all, I'd like to reframe the conversation a little bit, because it's a good idea to make all the required steps to boost the analytical culture in your company, but why would you want to do that in the first place? Why should we use more data in our company? It's important to keep in mind that the ultimate goal of any data analysis is to make more profit and to save lives, and there are also more exotic uses. We don't do this for fun, we must get results. But the vast majority of analytical projects fails. However, there is a way to ensure the success of your analytical initiative. You just adapt an analytical culture in your company. So, if you are serious about your data initiatives, if you want to ensure that all your efforts and your investment in manpower and time are secured, there is only one solution, adopt an analytical culture. Now the next question is, how do we get results? Typically, to solve an analytical problem, we'll follow a methodology in five steps, as described in this slide. Here I didn't invent anything. The content of this slide is really typical of what you will hear if you talk to any consultant specialized in analytics. So we start by defining a business question. Then we prepare the data to be able to answer this question. 
then we analyze the data, then we present the results to the people involved, typically the CEO, the CMO, or any other stakeholders who are concerned by these results. In the analytical field, the word stakeholders has a special technical meaning. It represents all the people interested in the analytical results. Then we deploy the result in production so that we have a real impact on the business. So that's the five steps for an analytical project, from start to finish. Now we are going to look at all the people who carry out these five steps. Typically, there are eight different profiles that use or consume the data. Alors, don't panic, we will explain in detail the role of each of these different profiles in the following slides. Here we recognize the stakeholders that we already discussed in the previous slide, but we will also find the CEO, CMO, CTO, the data scientist, the business analysts, the data engineers, the guys that take care of the database, the IT guys, and the CDPO. Now, the CDPO is a relatively new role. The CDPO, or Chief Data Privacy Officer, is in charge of guaranteeing the privacy of the confidential data as stated in the European legislation rules, commonly referred as the GDPR. Now, let's take a closer look at what each of these profiles do. The CEO, it runs the company. The IT guy makes sure that the PCs work well. The CDPO, we already discussed what he does in the previous slide. The data engineer buys the machine in the cloud to optimize the infrastructure to handle the load. And there is a common point to all these profiles. None of them look directly at the data. Let's now talk about the stakeholder. In the literature, this profile is sometimes also called business stakeholder. But to simplify things in this presentation, we'll just call it stakeholder. So he is typically the one who makes the company run. He knows the business, he knows how to make profits, how to save lives, etc. The SQL guys is the one who stores the data in the database. And to do that, he regularly has to perform transformation on the data. The business analyst is the one who understands the data well and is able to create relevant KPIs or predictive models to optimize the business. The data scientist finally writes complex code, studies machine learning algorithms and optimizes their parameters. There is one last profile, the data miner profile. You know, in the year 2000, there was no clear separation between these last three roles, and very often it was the same person who did everything. It was the data miner. But they are more and more difficult to find nowadays. A good advice, if you are lucky enough to have a data miner in your team, don't let him go. He is worth his weight in gold. Let's illustrate all this notion with some examples to make it a little bit more meaningful. So, an analytical project always starts with a business question. So, here is the business question for our first example is, we work for a telecom and we want to sell more ADSL subscription. To do this, we'll carefully select the people who will be contacted in our marketing campaign. So, what does it mean to be carefully selected, uh, to be included in the next marketing campaign? Well, it means, for example, that we are going to avoid to select contacts who just bought an ADSL subscription last month, or that we are going to avoid contacting people who have already received 20 calls from you in the last month. And we'll instead first contact the people who have a high video-on-demand consumption, because if they have a high video on demand consumption, it means that they have plenty of money and, well, they can buy a big ADSL internet subscription on top of that. So, that's the first approach. But I can already tell you right now that this campaign won't work very well. It's not an approach that is refined enough. We need to move on to a second, more refined iteration. So, what else could we do to improve the selection? I'll let you think about it for a little. To improve our selection, we can, for example, avoid to contact school, and then we will also avoid to contact people who have just cancelled their subscription recently with you. Finally, we won't contact the people who have been cut off for non-payment neither, because if they can't pay their bills now, they certainly won't be able to buy something extra. 
well, this is better, but it's still not enough. We need to, to move on to a third iteration. What else could we do to improve the selection? I'll let you think a little about it. Well, to improve our selection we will, for example, avoid to contact people who have just moved because they have other things to do than listen to you. And we will give priority to contact people who just had a successful repair at their home. For example, a technician just repairs their TV box. Because these people are so happy that everything is working properly again that the probability of buying an extra product is the triple of that of a normal person. So that was a small example that shows that an iterative approach is necessary to answer the business question correctly. This is another small example. Here we want to motivate surgeons and doctors to take better care of their patients. To do this, we created a KPI that monitors the amount of work done by doctors. The KPI in question focuses on the number of appendicitis operations. So if their KPI is good, the doctors get a little financial bonus at the end of the month. And by the way, this is a real life example. And in reality, the doctors they are not stupid. They quickly understood that they had to do a lot of appendicitis operation to be sure to get their bonus at the end of the month. So you arrive at the hospital for a sore throat and hop, no more appendicitis. Headaches? Yes, you guessed it. Also, no more appendicitis neither. So, we can see here through this example that it's necessary to have an iterative approach, to make a second iteration, to improve the KPI, to remove this unexpected effect, which is that everyone is operated of the appendicitis. In fact, when you make a KPI that monitors people activity, Sooner or later, there is almost always a perverse effect because of the KPI which could never have been anticipated beforehand. So this was again a small example to explain that it's necessary to have an iterative approach to refine your KPIs. Without an iterative approach, we will create irrelevant KPIs and eventually everyone will ignore all the KPIs because they are not considered relevant enough. And this is a disaster when you try to create an analytical culture in a company. If everyone ignores the KPIs, the analytical culture will never work. So I am now going to do a little live demonstration of this iterative concept. We will illustrate the iterative principle using Anatela. In a few minutes, we'll do several iterations quickly. And the business question that we want to solve is the following. In France, what is the postal code where the road is the most dangerous? So to answer this question, we will start by looking for some data set on the French government's open data site. On this website, we will find two interesting data sets. The vehicle data set that describes all the road accidents and the characteristic data set that gives the characteristics of all these accidents and in particular their GPS position. We will also find in this same governmental website on another page a shapefile that contains the layout of all the postal codes in France. So I have already downloaded these three files here. You see the vehicle dataset, the characteristic dataset, and the shapefile dataset. Now we are going to start the analysis. To do so, I'll create a little Anatela graph named Analysis. And we'll import inside this dataset the three files. Alors, to show you a little bit the data, here is what's inside the shape file. You can see the shape of France with all its postal code. Let's now look at the data set that describes the road accident.
We have 11 columns. The first column is the accident primary key, named NUMAC. Let's now look at the dataset that contains the characteristic of all this uh, accident. Again, it has the primary key named NUMAC. We also see that there are two other columns at the end that contain the latitude and the longitude of the accidents. Now we are going to join these two datasets into a single table, and the join key will be NUMAC. That's it. We now have, for each road accident, is GPS position, just here. A first idea is to visualize on a small map all this accident. To do this, we can use Kibela. Kibela is the BI tool included for free in the Timmy suite. So that's Kibela. For now, we can see that there are already some small datasets here. Um, and we are going to add a new dataset with the GPS position of our accident. So we go back to Anatella and we export our data to Kibela. And the dataset included into Kibela will be named Accident. You can see here that there is a control that allows you to specify which column has the GPS coordinates. But we still have to create this column. So we are going to add a small calculator box to do so. OK, that's it. Now we can export to Kibela. And ah, the box turns red. Uh, it doesn't work directly. We can see inside the log window here a little message that helps us to fix the error. This message says that we must have in the GPS column two numbers separated by a space. Let's check it out. Aha! Uh, the number format is wrong. There is a comma here instead of a period. That's easy to fix. Here we go. Now, this should be okay. Yes. Let's go back to Kibela. And the accident dataset just appeared. So let's select it and directly do a little visualization on a time map using the GPS coordinates. That's perfect. And we want a heat map with all the different settings at the minimum. And we want to see France. Let's run that. OK. So we can see that there are many accidents in Paris. But just with this map, it's difficult to know which postal code is the most dangerous. Here we already have a first approach that gives a first result. It's always interesting to look at the data, but as always in analytics, we must not stop here. We must continue towards a second iteration. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this first partial result is not in itself really bad. 
On the contrary, this partial result is part of an iterative process. It's just the first iteration. And without this first iteration, we would not have been able to reach the next iteration. So even if it's not the final result, it's still an almost mandatory step in the process of understanding the data in order to reach the final result. Let's now go back to Anatella. Let's put the Kibela box aside and continue with a geographical drain. To make this geographic drain, we will use our shapefile. And this is the content of the shapefile. In the shapefile, there are nine columns. The ID column contains the postal code. The last column contains the geometry, or the shape of the zip code. This geometry is represented here as a long string rather than a drawing, but it's exactly the same thing. So we are going to attach the GPS coordinate of the accident on one side and the zip code of the geometry on the other side. So we select the GPS on one side and the geometry on the other side. So that's it. We now have, for each accident, the exact zip code in which it took place. All that remains is to compute the number of accidents per zip code using a simple aggregate. That's it. Let's now sort the table on the count column. So the most dangerous zip code is the zip code 75016, this one. We can open it on Google Map. It's the Bois de Boulogne. It's a small forest inside Paris. For me, it's kind of strange. How come there are more accidents in the Bois de Boulogne, in a wood, than on the very busy Paris Ring? I'm not going to try to explain this phenomenon because it's not the point here, but maybe drivers are distracted by something else? What could it be? I'll let you draw your own conclusion. So we have just finished a second iteration of the analysis. We could say that the results are not very coherent. What could we do to improve them? A first idea to improve the result would be to say that the number of accidents in itself does not represent very well the danger of a postal of zip code. Indeed, in a huge zip code with many long roads, there will be more accidents just by construction, just because there are more roads and therefore more chance of accident. The bottom line is that there are more accidents on a large zip code, but that doesn't mean that a large zip code is really more dangerous. Therefore, we should create a new column named dangerousness, which would be a kind of standardization of the number of accidents that would take into account the total length of all the roads inside the zip code. Unfortunately, we don't have inside, inside our dataset the length of all the roads in a zip code. But we do have a column that contains the population, the number of inhabitants in each zip code, which is kind of similar. 
more inhabitants usually means more roads. So we are going to create a column named dangerousness, which is the number of accidents in a zip code divided by the number of inhabitants. So let's do it. Okay, that's it. We will sort the table to easily see the most dangerous zip code. So now we can see this table as a histogram. Well, that chart doesn't work so well because there are too many different zip codes to show. We'll just look at the first 20 zip codes. Here we see that these two zip codes are much more deadly and much more dangerous than all the others. Let's give a closer look at these two zip codes. These are the zip codes of the uh, Paris Orly Airport and the zip code of the uh, Lyon Saint Exupéry Airport. So, if we stop our analysis at this iteration, we will draw the conclusion that air plays cause big road accident. Obviously, in practice, that's not really the case. So, we need a third iteration to fix that. Let's look at the exact population of the two zip codes with airport. We see that the population is 7 for the first airport and 9 for the second airport. And indeed, it makes sense. Near an airport, the quantity of house is usually very low and the traffic very high. It just means that our normalization is just screwed up. A better way to normalize the data would be to divide the number of accidents by the area of the zip code, rather than by the number of inhabitants. So let's just do that. So now we see that the most dangerous zip code in France is the 75,004. That makes sense. It's exactly in the middle of Paris. So this was a little live demonstration to illustrate the importance of the iterative approach when resolving an analytical question. In the small example here, it was a very simple question, but it still illustrates the point quite well. You have to realize that in a company, a business expert with 10 or 20 years of expertise in his field will have a much more refined and a much more subtle reasoning about its data than what we just did in a few minutes on this simple example. In summary, for business experts to adopt an analytical approach, they need to be able to work in an iterative way and to be able to easily do a lot of iteration. So if you remember correctly, a few minutes ago, I showed you this slide. It represents the traditional way of doing analytical projects. It's called the waterfall approach, and it has one big flow. It's not iterative. This waterfall approach is attractive, but in analytics, it doesn't work. It's all the more unfortunate that this approach is imposed on you by more than 90% of the tools used to carry out data science projects or analytical projects. Indeed, in data science, when you created a small bit of code to answer a specific business question, it's very common to come back to this little code after a few months and do large modifications to this code because now you have a better understanding of the business problems that you need to solve. That's why data science is a very special field. Unfortunately, almost all software providers don't understand that this iterative process is really needed. 
and thus they provide a software where it's really difficult to iterate. This means that in the end, there is almost no analytical solution that allows to iterate easily and quickly. And the dire consequences are directly observed. Despite a technology that seems to progress, the number of field analytical projects is increasing. And it's not a surprise, because despite the best will of the people involved, if you impose a lousy waterfall methodology on them, it's not going to work. Fortunately, when things go wrong, there is almost always a good stakeholder who knows the business well, that notices that the results are inconsistent, and then he sounds the alarm, before the company loses millions in something that doesn't work. So the first reflex when something goes wrong is to look for the culprit. And the culprit... Uh, ah, it cannot be the data scientist, because he was so busy optimizing the epsilon parameter of the stochastic gradient descent algorithm by optimizing the Hessian matrix of the convex loss function of the back propagation of the deep learning network. And so clearly, it can't be his fault. It can't be neither the business analyst's fault, because she simply analyzed the data that she received from the SQL geyser. And it's clearly not her fault that the data that she received was messed up. So obviously the culprit is the SQL guy. And he's getting a lot of grief for it. And he's tired of being kicked on every five minutes. So he doesn't do anything anymore. And everything screw ups even more after that. So it's not a question of searching for a culprit, but it's rather a question of changing the methodology. We will now see how to adopt a methodology that allows to have a successful analytical project and to propagate an analytical culture in your company. So we have already seen uh, that the first good idea is to avoid any waterfall methodology and replace it with an iterative approach. What does it mean in practice? It means that the analytical process is no longer represented using this big red arrow there, but rather like this, like a circle. This circle represents the iterative aspect of the process. The iterative approach is the first of the five key points that enable your company to adopt an analytical culture. So how does it work? We start by preparing the data and analyzing it. Then we deploy and then we look at the results. This leads us to review how we answered the business question in the first place. Then we can refine our understanding of our business question to improve our approach. As our business question has changed, it's necessary to change the data preparation to be able to answer the new question. And then we start a new iteration. It's really an iterative process, and at each iteration, the results and the questions are improved to deliver more and more knowledge and value for your company. This ultimately leads to a virtuous circle there that ensures continuous improvement of all the processes within your company. Of course, what we would like to do is to do as many iterations as possible and as fast as possible. So what's blocking us? What's really taking time in this virtuous circle? What's blocking us is the time required to do the data preparation. It takes between 80 to 90% of the working time. And this is a known fact. Anyone who has ever done any data science projects knows this. For example, Forbes magazine did a survey on the subject and they arrived to the same conclusion. 80% of the working time of an analytical project is spent on data preparation. Similarly, the New York Times magazine say exactly the same thing. Data preparation takes up to 80% of the time spent on an analytical project. And the magazine InfoWorld repeats the same thing. Data preparation takes up to 80% of the working time of an analytical project. So I hope now that I convince you that data preparation is a real center of the problem. It consumes 
80% of the working time and it's crucial. Without a good data preparation, any further analysis is doomed to fail. In an analytical project, it's all very well to use ultra-complicated and high-performance machine learning algorithms, such as Timmy Modeler, but that's not the real center of the problem. The core of the problem, the crucial part when you are doing analytics, is to make sure that the data preparation is well done. If we want data preparation to be well made, we still have to answer one question. Who will do the data preparation? It's important to answer this question correctly, because the data preparation is the real center of the problem, so you cannot screw it up. Moreover, the data preparation depends on your current business question. In other words, different business questions give different data preparation. And this business question, it changes over time. At each iteration, and these are the iterations, it's refined because we understand the problem to solve better. When I say we, who are these people who understand the problem better and better? Typically, it will be either the business as an analyst or the stakeholder. But very often it will be just the stakeholders, because they are the only ones who understand all the little business subtleties that are necessary to refine the analysis. They are the only ones who have over 20 years of expertise behind them to see if the results are consistent. Now there are some exceptional situations where we have access to data scientists who are really dedicated to their employer. And in this case, they make the effort to learn all the little intricacies of their employer's business. But this type of employee is increasingly difficult to find, especially in a context where data scientists are leapfrogging from one company to the other every three months. Well, obviously, don't make me say what I didn't say either. I didn't say that you should force your stakeholders to write code. That's not their job. And forcing them to code in a barbaric language is just a waste of everyone's time. That's not where the stakeholders bring the most value to your company. On the other hand, stakeholders must be an integral part of the problem-solving process. They must be able to intervene to correct the aiming at each iteration, thanks to their large business expertise. In fact, we could summarize in a single sentence all the elements that we have seen so far, all the elements that are allowing us to have a successful analytical project. This sentence is simply, those who understand the problem to be solved must be the one to solve it. This sentence, it sums up everything that we have said so far and nobody can really criticize it. So I would go even one step further. I would say those who understand the problem to be solved must be those who do the data preparation. Because doing a good data preparation is practically equivalent to solving the analytical problem anyway, because the rest of the process is practically negligible. This rule of those who understand the problem to be solved must be the one solving it seems obvious, but in practice it's almost never applied because to make a good data preparation it's necessary that stakeholders and business analysts both spend time together on it. And for that you need a data preparation tool without code, also called self-service tool. The self-service aspect of the data preparation tool, it sounds a little bit insignificant, but in reality it's a critical feature to allow stakeholders and business analysts to do the data prep together. Self-service is the second key point that allows an analytical culture to spread throughout your company. A self-service data preparation tool is good, but it's not yet enough. Indeed, business analysts and stakeholders will have to collaborate with the six other profiles to achieve meaningful data analysis. They will need to be able to easily interact with the SQL guy, the data scientist, the data engineer, the IT guy, the CDPO and the CEO. So in short, you need a federative tool that allows all the profiles to collaborate around the same objective to solve the current business problem. 
the federating aspect is the third key point that allows an analytical culture to spread out throughout your company. Alors, let's go back to this slide. It says 87% of analytical projects never have impact on the business. So what does it mean? It means that the analytical project remains in the embryonic stage without being put in production and therefore without any impact on the business. And that's actually what you see when you arrive in a company that is starting out in the field of analytics. There are a lot of initiatives on all sides, lots of motivated people, but nothing that goes into production. So a fourth key point for the success of your analytical initiative is to be able to easily put your finding in production. So there are many reasons why the switch to production might fail. One of these reasons is the instability of the software stack that you are using, especially if you use tools developed in Java, those are particularly unstable. Another reason is that often you have done a prototype on a small subset of data. And then when you go into production, you have to process all the data from the whole company. And then it becomes just too much expensive. That's the type of situation that happens all the time when you work in the cloud. Another reason of failure is that you use a tool that only works well on a small amount of data and then it completely crashes on large amount of data. These are often in-memory type of tools that are limited in volume and ends up crashing continuously. The fifth and final key to the success of your analytical initiative and the spread of the analytical culture in your company is to avoid any variable cost. Indeed, let's imagine that for each iteration of this virtuous circle, you have to pay half a million euro in cloud fees to Amazon. In this situation, I can directly tell you that you are not likely to do many iterations. Another perverse effect of variable costs is to penalize and punish the most motivated data scientist in your team. Indeed, let's imagine a young and enthusiastic data scientist who makes intensive use of your infrastructure to explore your data and get the most value out of it. Well, this guy, he will cost much more than his colleagues, less motivated, who spend their time drinking coffee at the coffee machine. And at the end of the month, the good, motivated data scientist, he will get all the blame by the CFO because of the high cloud costs that he causes, especially compared to his colleagues. In short, a data science cloud tool that operates on a variable cost has the effect of penalizing, punishing, discouraging, and ultimately preventing your best people from working. Really, variable fees completely block any chance of success for your analytical initiative. So that's it, we have seen together the five key points necessary for the success of your analytical initiative. Now that we know these five key points, we still have to see how to get them into your own company. The rest of this presentation is one, a summary of the five key points that we just covered together, and two, tips on how to get this situation where your business benefits from having these five key points. And then when that happens, the possibilities are infinite. Sky is the limit. So the analytical culture is based on the simple idea that those who understand the problem to solve should be the one solving it. With this idea, your analytical initiative succeeds and the analytical culture spreads throughout your company. The idea is simple, but it's almost never implemented because it requires these five elements, these five prerequisites, which are almost never available in companies. These are, in fact, the five key elements that we just discovered together in the previous slides. So, to summarize, to create an analytical culture in your company, you first need a tool that allows an iterative approach. No waterfall. This iterative approach is illustrated here using this spinning circle. Then you need a data preparation tool that works in self-service to allow those who understand the problem to solve it. Then you need a federative tool to do data preparation so that everyone can collaborate together to produce real value for your business. You need a data preparation tool that guarantees easy industrialization of all your findings. And finally, you need a tool without any variable cost. So that's it, everything is summarized here. Here are the five key points, the five prerequisites to create or boost the analytical culture in your company. 
Strangely, there is currently only one data science solution that meets these five prerequisites. And then you are surprised that more than 75% of the analytical project fails. <laughs> that's no surprise. So that solution is Anatella. Anatella is the only solution that provides these five prerequisites required to create an analytical culture in your company. So it's very well to say that, but it's even better to prove it. So in the next slide, I'll quickly give you some clues that will help you to make up your mind. Is Anatella really the only solution that provides these five key points that are required to create an analytical culture? We saw together during the small Anatella live demo that we can use an iterative approach to design our data transformation. So the, for the point one, it's checked. In fact, Anatella has many other features that are required to adopt an iterative approach when working on analytical projects. Some of these features are really unique to Anatella. For example, Anatella provides a revolutionary caching system, some advanced refactoring features, and a very special way of managing metadata called Metadata Free. These features are required to work in an iterative way, and they are only available in Anatella. For those who are interested, we made two videos on the subject. The links to these videos are in the description below. The two videos in question are quite technical since they are actually the video number five and six of the basic training program to learn how to use Anatella. So I tell you right now to understand these two videos, it's better to have watched the previous video, video two, three and four of the same program. We also saw together during the small live demo that we can use Anatella entirely without typing one line of code, entirely in self-service. So self-service is check. As for the federative aspect, I bet a lot of you are thinking that I'm going to talk about a pretty and user-friendly graphical interface rather than a console in text mode with a black background and green characters. Well, <laughs> it's true that this helps, but it's far from sufficient to obtain a tool that is federative. To be federative, a tool must offer, in addition to a nice graphical interface, a system that is based on the concept of abstraction layer. Furthermore, the tool must not be a simple code generator, because this imposes strong limitations that also prevent the federative aspect. If you are interested, we have a short video that covers this topic. The link is in the description below. As for the automation aspect, it's something important, but in the end, it's not very complicated to achieve uh, when you already have a tool such as Anatella. A good integration with a scheduling tool is just enough. We chose Jenkins as our scheduler because it's easily extensible, it already has hundreds of plugins to handle absolutely every possible scheduling situation. And on top of that, from the start, Jenkins is a scheduler that is optimized to do distributed computing, to run Anatella on hundreds of computers, so that we never run out of computing power. Although, you know, with Anatella, not having enough computing power is not going to happen very soon. Also, in the description below, you will find links to videos that show the integration between Anatella and Jenkins. In short, in just four mouse clicks, you put an Anatella process in production in Jenkins. Really, automation with Anatella, super easy. As for the operating cost of an Anatella-based system, they are very low, mainly because a very small hardware infrastructure is able to handle almost any computation load and any volumetry. As a result, you can expect to have almost constant infrastructure cost with no variable part. And the license fee for Timmy and Anatella are also constant and independent of the data volume. So you can rest at ease, no variable cost. And in addition to the five prerequisites that we just saw, Anatella is, icing on the cake, the fastest and the most scalable data preparation solution on the market. Technically, Anatella is more than 20 years ahead of absolutely all of its competitors, if the competitors ever manage to catch up, which is still unlikely. So, if you are serious about your data initiative, if you want to ensure that your efforts and your investments in manpower and time are paying off, there is only one solution, Anatella. 
Anatella is the heart of the Timi framework. It's a wonderful data preparation tool. It's a great gift to give to everyone who works with data in your company. But it's not the only tool in the Timi suite. There is also Modeler, an automated machine learning tool, Stardust, a real-time 3D clustering tool, and Kibela, a data visualization tool. So here are a few testimonials from happy people because their analytical initiatives are successful. If you go to the G2 website, you will find many more very positive reviews about Anatella and Timmy. You have to realize that when I say that Anatella is the only data preparation solution that combines the five key points above, it's not a false marketing argument. It's real. The testimonials that you will find on G2 demonstrate that all this is real. To tell you the truth, we have on the G2 website the highest satisfaction rate of any data science solution. At Timmy, we are driven by one value in particular, ethics. And with this in mind, before any profit, what we want to see is your analytical projects succeed. As each company approaches analytics in a different way, your free trial period with Timmy is flexible to adapt to your way of working. Usually, two months are enough to understand all what a great analytics tool like Timmy can offer you. In addition, we are here to support you until you have been able to demonstrate with your first success how great the analytical culture is and, in general, how great analytics with Timmy are. So, all you have to do now is to take the steps and join the hundreds of Dynamics companies innovating through analytics with Timmy. And to make the step, it's simple. You go to timmy.eu, you click on the Download Timmy button, and then you click on the big blue button in the middle. Afterwards, an automatic wizard installs Timmy, and after a few minutes, you can start playing with your data. No need for administrative rights at any time. Everything installs by itself automatically. Now it's up to you. It's your turn to play. You have all the keys to get started. So, thank you very much for your attention, and have a great day.